Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll get started. So if we could all, I guess, just shuffle in here. Um, so c congratulations on almost finishing your, your first day of Mises, Mises University. Uh, this is the part when the lectures become great and they truly become entertaining. Oh, that was the part when you're supposed to laugh. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Off to a rough start, no. All right, so uh, we just had a great talk on money, the, the basics of money, the origins of money, why money exists, what, what, what types of um, uh, things does money do, right? The optimal supply of money, the winners and losers for money, and so on. We want to continue that discussion and talk about the Austrian theory of banking, all right? Um, <clears throat> so I usually like to have a overview slide just so you know what you're getting yourselves into. Uh, so what's this presentation about, uh, and why should you care? Well, I first want to talk about why banks exist. A lot of people don't know this. They, they might not know all right, what are the important functions of a bank, what do they do. A lot of people just think banks are just run by some uh, you know, blood-sucking capitalists, and they provide no uh, value whatsoever. Uh, the Austrian perspective is, 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 is slightly different on that, to say the least. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, related to this question is we want to talk about the difference between what's known as loan banking and deposit banking, right? Because a lot of commercial banks, a modern commercial bank, really combines these two features. But you know, and this is this is taking a page from Rothbard. Uh, we want to separate these two functions because they have very different effects on the money supply, and also, as we will discuss tomorrow, very different effects on, say, economic growth. All right. Um, I then want to discuss how deposit banking affects the money supply. So loan banking does not affect the money supply. Deposit banking, as we'll see, does affect the money supply, particularly when we are on a, we were looking at fractional reserve deposit banking. <clears throat> now, related to this is I want to discuss how free banking, how unregulated competition among fractional reserve banks, how that limits credit expansion. We're going to discuss what exactly credit expansion is, but that's increasing the money supply by making loans, um, not loan banking, as we'll see, uh, but it's, 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 it's different. And this leads to a, this is related to a very important concept known as the adverse clearing mechanism. This is what restrains banks, as we'll see, on the free market. It is only when the central bank gets involved, all right, the, the central bank, we're all Austrian economists here, so we, we, we have a little bit of a, a negative view of central banks, you could say, pessimistic perhaps, uh, which is completely justified in my opinion, uh, but we're going to see how central banking affects the money supply, how central banks are really the, 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 the agents of the government that enable fractional reserve banks to increase the money supply. And we're going to take a little bit of time to discuss the money multiplier process, which is the step-by-step -step process in which uh, the money supply increases. So there's a lot of things to cover. Uh, we're going to, we've only got a, a, a short amount of time, uh, but we're going to hopefully get through all of these, uh, all of these very important uh, topics. All right. So what is money? Well, we just had a, a great talk on this. Money is a generally accepted medium of exchange. Right? It's the thing that we, it's, it's, the, it's the open sesame to buying goods, right? If we want to go to the grocery store, we, we, use, uh, we use money. If we want to uh, earn income, we work for money and so on. All right, now why am I bringing this up? Uh, because I want to talk a little bit about um, some Misesian typology of money, right? We have what's known as money proper, okay? Money proper is really what we ultimately think of as money. All right, so on the gold standard, it was a commodity, right? Obviously, gold. Gold is a commodity. Gold is can be used for industrial purposes, for ornamental purposes, for religious purposes, and so on. Or in the modern economy, as we'll see, it is paper made irredeemable by fiat, by decree. Right, the dollar bills. We can go to a bank and we can uh, take out, we can't get gold anymore, unfortunately, uh, but we can get dollar bills right, uh, for the money in our bank account. And so that's what money proper is. Um, we, we, what is a money substitute? Well, money substitute is a claim to a fixed amount of money proper. Uh, strictly speaking, it's a claim, it's something that the public subjectively perceives as a claim to a fixed amount of money proper. It might not always be redeemable, um, or all of them can't be redeemed at the same time, but as long as the public believes 
that what they have can be redeemed, then it is a money substitute. Most of us just use money substitutes uh, for buying uh, goods and services, right? We, use a, we don't write checks anymore, but we do have uh, debit cards, we could say. We'll talk about. All right, so examples of money substitutes, bank notes, bank deposits, so on and so forth. All right, so the money substitutes are what we really use uh, when buying goods and services, but the money proper is sort of fundamentally what we actually think of as uh, money, okay? This is important, all right? So uh, picture is worth a thousand words, so might as well go through some pictures here. All right, um, under the gold standard, we've got gold coins, 1881, uh, you can't see the United, but you see United States of America, 5D, $5. Back in the day, $1 was worth 1 20th an ounce of gold. So this was a $5 gold coin. It was uh, one ounce of gold, okay? And we could use this. We could, we could buy goods with this and so on. Uh, but, you know, then people thought that this was, this was kind of cumbersome. So as, as, uh, as Dr. Klein discussed, people started to use banks. And here's a bank note from, yes, the St. Nicholas Bank in New York, Santa Claus. That's how he gets the money to pay for the elves. He ran a fractional reserve bank back in the day. See, you learn something new every day. Uh, so the St. Nicholas Bank will pay $5, which is one-fourth an ounce of gold, to the bearer on demand, okay? It's saying, look, you can trust us. We're a money, you know, this is a money substitute. We'll pay you $5. And you say, Again, if, if, if you wouldn't know any better, you'd say, well, what is $5? Well, you know that $5 is one-fourth an ounce of gold. The dollar was a certain weight of uh, the, gold, um, uh, the gold commodity, we could say. All right, things got a little bit different uh, under, our, under our, 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 our friend, the Federal Reserve, All right? Yeah, exactly, boo. Um, you're in the right place when you can do that, right? So we have here a Federal Reserve note. Uh, United States of America, $20 in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. This was the early years of the Federal Reserve, right? And $20 was one ounce of gold. So you could go to a bank and you would say, I'd like one, uh, I, I would like $20 in gold coin, right? And you would get one ounce of gold payable to the bearer on demand. As uh, Dr. Klein pointed out, one ounce of gold now is about $2,400. So prices have gone up a little bit. All right, so this brings me to 1933. Things changed a little bit. Uh, as we have Darth Vader here, he's saying, I'm altering the deal, pray, I do not alter it any further. 1933, we went off the domestic gold standard. Uh, you could not give a dollar uh, to the bank and say, I would like 1 20th an ounce of gold, right? Um, we are, you know, our money basically since then has more or less looked like this, Federal Reserve note. $1, if you have a $20 bill and you go to a bank and you'd say, I would like $20, they look at you, they might give you two tens. And you say, no, come on, $20, right? Maybe give them a little wink or something, they'll give you four fives. They're not gonna give you gold, that's done. The, the deal has been altered, so to speak. And it did get altered further in 1971 when we went off the international gold standard. And so most of us, uh, we, we don't use dollars. Dollars are now the money proper. Right? We, we think of everything else as being redeemable in dollars. So back in the day when we would write checks, the check, uh, we, you know, the, the, our checkbook, which is a link to a, de, a demand deposit, that would be redeemable in dollars. Most of us, we use electronic checks, uh, such as a, a debit card, right? And this is really the, 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 the sort of the money substitute. We can kind of think of it as an electronic uh, money substitute, okay? So that's what we're, what we're working with here. All right, what is banking? All right, well, a bank is an institution that makes loans and or issues money substitutes. Okay, that's all really a bank is when we're talking about, um, you know, your average bank, such as a commercial bank. So when the institution is making loans, the first function is called loan banking, right? The, 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 you know, that, the, the act of making loans, right? that's, that's loan banking. Uh, the issuing of, of money substitutes, that's the second function, that is called deposit banking. Right? So most financial institutions, most banks combine these, but it's important for us to separate them because as I sort of alluded to at the beginning of the talk, uh, they have very different effects, right? Um, <clears throat> okay. So that's what a bank is. 
Why do banks exist? Why are these functions important? All right, well, loan banking exists because financial intermediation lowers the cost of finding borrowers and lenders. All right, if let's say you have savings and you want to lend it to someone, uh, you'd have to actually find someone without banks, without financial intermediaries, you would have to find someone that would actually want to engage in some type of loan contract with you, who, who wants your savings and would pay the interest that you, that you desire. Conversely, if you want to borrow money, you'd have to find someone who is willing to lend you money. Uh, and you know, that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of energy, uh, and so on. Instead, we can just use the services of a bank. We can uh, lend a bank money, the bank will turn around, and they will then lend it to someone else, and they will pay us uh, interest. We'll, we'll go through that a little bit more. And likewise, if you want to borrow money, you can go to a bank and you can borrow. So this is a very, very, very crucial part of the economy, all right? And this type of uh, banking, loan banking, as we'll see, facilitates economic growth when time preferences fall or they decrease. We'll learn more about that tomorrow. This leads to uh, uh, basically a, a longer structure of production and so on. Or uh, We're going to talk about that. And you've got deposit banking. Why does deposit banking exist? Well, it exists because gold and silver coins, those are cumbersome, and they can, eat, you know, they can be easily stolen, right? If you have a bunch of gold coins, uh, you, know, you have to carry, around and carry them around in a, in a bag. It, it, it can get awkward. Uh, if you want to buy a house with gold coins, then it's going to be really awkward, unless you just want to look cool and just like pour a bunch of gold uh, on the, you know, the, the little checkout belt at the grocery store. Uh, you're not going to want to do that. And nowadays, people don't want to use cash. If you lose your wallet and it has a bunch of cash in it, then you have to rely on the charity of, of whoever finds the wallet or the altruism. They, they're, they're looking out for you um, to, to, to then try to track you down. If you lose your wallet and it just has your debit card, you have to cancel your debit card. It's, it's no harm, no foul. It's, it's an inconvenience, but it, you keep your money, all right? Uh, so for small transactions... People, when they deposited gold in the bank, they would use banknotes. Those are easy to carry, and they're, they're used for, for small transactions, right? Uh, a, a, a check, uh, or nowadays a debit card, uh, those can be used for large transactions, but even now we use debit cards for small transactions to everyone who accepts them. Debit cards, they can be precisely divided down to the cent, and they also require verification, so a little bit of extra uh, security, okay? So uh, both types of banking, uh, both types of banks are, are, are very important uh, for the market economy. We, we really could not get by uh, with this. It would be very cumbersome if everyone was keeping a bunch of gold in their, in their pockets, right? If you, you go to Mises U and instead of getting like $20 to go get something at Chipotle, they give you like some silver coins. Of course, we would probably all like that, but most people it would be, it would be an in in inconvenience, right? All right, so we're going to look at Loan banking. We're going to start off with loan banking. So assume we're on a gold standard, right? It's the gold standard we all know and love. So, I, you know, I decide that I like being an economics professor, but maybe it's just not for me. I'm, 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 I'm interested in, in, in making some money. Right? I, want to, I want to live large. I want to, I want to, I want to advance. So I'm going to uh, start my own bank. Right? I decrease my consumption by about $10,000, and I, I start a bank with my savings. It's called the Newman Bank. It's extremely prestigious, right? High, you know, name recognition. Everyone goes, "Oh, Newman, all right, you can trust him," all right? Uh, so, you know, it's 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 as we'll see. I'm 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 looking out. Um, I'm trying to expand into the future, right? So, hopefully, you've seen this. This is a this is a balance sheet. It's got assets on the left side, and then there's equity and liabilities on the right side. This is uh, very, very important so we can track revenues and costs, and we can see, okay, um, how much money are we making, how much money are we not making. So assets, we could say things that we own. Uh, equity is our net worth. Liabilities are what we owe, and these always have to balance out. Assets always have to equal equity plus liabilities. If they don't, you're doing something wrong. So if I decrease uh, consumption by $10,000 and I start a bank with my savings, just right now I've got $10,000 in gold, 
Those are my assets. We're not looking at the building, any types of capital goods uh, that, that I'm, that I'm uh, using in the building. We're not, we're not concentrating on any of that. We're just concentrating on the gold and the equity. I haven't uh, borrowed anything, so I have no liabilities. I instead just have a net worth that's equal to my assets, right? $10,000 is equal to $10,000, right? So then the Newman Bank is going to make a $9,000 loan to Jonathan Newman for one year. The Newman Bank, we just, we just stick with the Newmans for now. That's sort of who, we, who I trust. I'm going to say, well, I'm going to just lend to, to a fellow Newman, right? Okay, so what does this look like? Uh, I'm going to lend $9,000 in gold to Jonathan. So the gold goes down by $9,000, and I instead have an IOU from him. Right, that basically says, all right, I'll pay you back $9,000 plus interest in the future. Okay, Present value of that right now is $9,000, so we've still got $10,000 plus $10,000. Okay. And if everything goes right, one year from now, Jonathan will pay me back $9,000 plus interest, and then my equity is going to go up. If I, if, I, if I ascertain that he's a trustworthy borrower and he'll pay back the loan, he'll use it for productive purposes and so on, I'm going to make money. And then the next time I can say maybe lend $10,000 to someone else. So something that's important is that the money supply has not changed. Okay? The only thing that's changed is the composition of cash balances. The Newman Bank's cash balance has gone down by $9,000 and Jonathan Newman's cash balance has gone up by $9,000. It's just the money has literally switched hands. No new money has been created. No money has been destroyed and so on. All right. So this process here, this is really, you, you know, we're on, you know, I'm a lender on the loanable funds market and Jonathan is a borrower on the loanable funds market, right? These are how funds are uh, basically, the, the, this is how financial intermediation works, right? So I am lending to Jonathan. All right. All right. So let's look at complex loan banking. We've got the same balance sheet as before. And I say, well, I can't lend any more money out of, uh, out of my assets. I don't have enough gold. I want to have about $1,000 in, uh, in a buffer. So I've decided that, well, uh, it's not really going to be a successful bank if I'm just sticking with Newman's, right? There's only two of us, right? So we need, there's got to be more people. I have to expand, right? So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to borrow money from Pear Byland uh, in the form of a certificate of deposit, which basically he is going to now lend the Newman Bank money uh, for one year, and I will pay him back $5,000 plus interest. This is not a money substitute. He can't spend it. It's basically just stuck at the bank, and he's going to say, well, uh, if everything goes right, I'm going to be able to pay him back, and he's going to be he's going to make some money. He's going to have uh, five thousand dollars plus interest at the end of the year. All right. So my liabilities go up because now I owe a five thousand dollars certificate of deposit to pair in one year. Okay, that's worth five thousand dollars now. So as you'll see, uh, fifteen thousand dollars. My equity, my 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 liabilities. Uh, the, the the equity plus liabilities goes up to fifteen thousand dollars. What am I going to do with that money? I could just sit on, on the gold, and then my gold will go up five thousand. But uh, I want to actually make money with this. I don't just want to borrow from him and then pay it back for no reason. So I am going to uh, then make a five thousand dollar loan to the Mises Institute, and I will then have an IOU from the Mises Institute. Okay, so notice what's going on. I have two IOUs, one from Jonathan, one from the Mises Institute, and then I owe money to pair. And if everything goes right, the money that comes in from Jonathan and from the Mises Institute, I will be able to pay uh, what I owe pair, right? And I'm going to be paying pair a lower interest rate than what I earn from the money, uh, from, from the loan at the Mises Institute. I'm not taking advantage of everyone. I'm the one going out and finding people. Uh, I'm accepting people's savings and I'm lending it out, all right? The money supply, once again, remains constant. There is only just a shifting of the cash balances. Okay, that's all that's happened, okay? So this is loan banking. It's, 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 it's very, very important. Um, uh, a lot of us, we channel our savings in a bank if we, again, we, 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 we purchase a certificate of deposit uh, and so on. All right, it's different with deposit banking. 
All right, now let's say the Newman Bank decides to move into uh, deposit banking. All right. Uh, Tate Fegley deposits $10,000 of gold at the Newman Bank. Apparently, everyone in this economy is only people at Mises University, but then again, who's complaining? Uh, so this is the balance sheet of the Newman Bank. All right. We're going to start over. We're not going to look at anything else. We're just going to say, well, just concentrating on uh, this one um, uh, this one feature, shall we say, complete new balance sheet and so on. We've got $10,000 in gold reserves, and then we've got a liability, a deposit to take. Tate can spend that money. Maybe it's in the form of banknotes or a deposit uh, account. He can spend that money at an inst another institution. He could then tomorrow say, you know what, I'd like $2,000 back in gold coin and so on, right? He is going to do this because it is convenient. Uh, he wants to minimize the amount of gold he has in his house, right? So then what am I going to do? Well, as we'll see, the Newman Bank is going to do something with this money. But just something to note, uh, just to reinforce, is that the deposit is a money substitute. Unlike the certificate of deposits, a little confusing with banking terminology, but the deposit account, uh, Tate can spend that money. And he can also redeem it at any point in time. The certificate of deposit is only redeemable at the end of the year. Okay, You can't, you can't, you can't go to the Newman Bank a uh, pair can't go to the Newman Bank tomorrow and say, I'd like my money back. I'd say, well, you signed the contract. Uh, you got to wait a year, right? And once again, so far, the money supply has not changed. It's only the composition of the cash balances that has, uh, that has changed, okay? So <clears throat> this, is, this is all that's gone on. All that's happened is, is uh, Tate's cash balance has changed from $10,000 in gold to $10,000 in, in a uh, deposit, right? Okay. So we've got the same balance sheet as before. Um, <clears throat> what do we, what can we tell from this balance sheet? Well, we can tell from this balance sheet that the Newman Bank right now operates at a 100% reserve ratio. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, the reserve ratio is, well, it's the ratio of reserves to deposits. Okay, we have this formula right here. Right, uh, so we've got ten thousand divided by ten thousand is one times one hundred is is, is one hundred percent. Right, so who said Austrians can't do math? Right, you know we all got this. Right, okay. Um, in uh, at the Newman Bank, all money substitutes are what are known as money certificates. They are redeemable for the money proper. Okay, so Tate. Uh, can redeem all $10,000 for the gold. Uh, if Tate then spends the money somewhere else, they can redeem all $10,000 for the gold. I have all the reserves to meet all hypothetical withdrawals. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what am I going to do uh, with this? I, 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 you know, I, I, I have to pay for the, you know, I have to pay the, incur the costs of, of storing the money. Um, I'm also going to, um, you know, have to deal with it. I might have to pay uh, uh, my, my employees and so on. So how am I going to make money from this? Well, what I'm going to do is, let's say, I'm going to make a $90,000 loan to Matt McCaffrey, right? And I'm going to make this loan by just opening up another deposit account for, for Matt, all right? So here we have, what do we have here? All right, on the asset side, I once again, because uh, I'm, I'm lending money, I have an IOU because Matt has to pay me back $90,000 plus interest in the future. All right, my liability, I have a deposit to Matt because Matt can then take that money and he can spend it somewhere. He could redeem it for gold if he so chooses and so on. So the assets of the bank have gone up from $10,000 to $100,000. Right? And same thing with the equity and liabilities. They always have to balance out at the end. If not, you're cooking the books, as they say. You're doing something wrong, All right? Um, so this is a fractional reserve bank. We only have so many reserves for deposits, All right? Now, economically, depositors might perceive the money is always being redeemable for the money proper. Legally, how it's actually been settled in the courts is that this is technically a call loan. The depositor is legally lending money to the bank uh, that they can redeem at any time, okay? So, um, <clears throat> the process of fractional reserve banking uh, leads to 
uh, credit expansion, right? This is increasing the money supply by making loans. This is what the Newman Bank has done. I've increased the money supply by making loans. I've made a loan to Matt, and I've literally just opened up another deposit account for him. Or if, say, he was banking at the bank, I would just add more money into his already existing account, right? Uh, the money supply has increased by $90,000, and just in total, what do we have here? We've got $100,000 in money substitutes, $10,000 in money certificates, right? Because only $10,000 of the $100,000 can be redeemed for the money proper. And the rest is what Mises calls fiduciary media. These are unbacked claims to the money proper. Any fractional reserve bank, by definition, if its reserves are less than its deposits, it has fiduciary media. Right, credit expansion. The, the credit expansion is creating fiduciary media. You're creating um, money substitutes. All right. Now we're going to analyze this. We're going to see. Okay, is this actually really sustainable? Would a bank actually just make a, a huge loan of ninety thousand dollars like that? As as we'll see, the answer is going to be no. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to talk a little bit more about fractional reserve banking. Um, Newman Bank is operating at a ten percent. Fractional reserve ratio, right? $10,000 in reserves, $100,000 in money substitutes. And because we're operating in a fractional reserve ratio, the Newman Bank cannot meet all potential claims or potential withdrawals, right? If Tate wants to redeem $5,000, I can do it. If Tate and Matt want to redeem $15,000, I can't do it. I only have $10,000 in gold coins, right? So <clears throat> the Newman Bank, however, estimates that it will never have to actually pay out all those claims. It's making sort of an entrepreneurial judgment, if you will, that, well, in these days, our depositors are going to want this money and so on. We're going to have money coming in. The money's going to go out. It's, 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 it's an entrepreneurial venture, we could say. All right. So uh, a bank is liquid if it has enough reserves to meet current withdrawals. Right, so if Tate wants five thousand uh, dollars, I will be able to pay it. The Newman Bank will be able to pay it. The Newman Bank will be liquid. Uh, illiquid is it's not enough reserves to meet current uh, withdrawals. So if say people want hundred thousand dollars in gold, I, I can't do it. The Newman Bank uh, cannot meet uh, their their demand. Right, so I would then need to sell my assets. I need to raise money really quickly, or I would have to go bankrupt, right? So a fractional reserve bank is always, out of all potential withdrawals, it's always a liquid because it's, by definition, it's a fractional reserve. But the bank is going to estimate that it will never have to pay out all of those claims. All right, so you might be thinking, wait a second. The Newman Bank could just create $90,000 out of thin air. Or why doesn't it just keep creating uh, uh, money? If fractional reserve banking is not fraudulent, then fractures of banks, they're literally just money machines. And mainstream economists would agree, and they'd say, well, if banks can increase the money supply, they will do so endlessly. Um, as, as in our example, the free market has allowed the Newman Bank to increase the money supply by $90,000 out of thin air. Uh, this has been called, uh, say, wildcat banking. On the free market, you had these banks that were created back in the day out in the boonies um, where the wildcats roamed, I guess. And they would just issue a bunch of money, and they would then abscond with the gold. They'd leave, and it would uh, ruin a town or something like that, right? Or if you have a huge increase in the supply of banknotes, then you obviously get a very large uh, rise in prices and a decline in purchasing power, right? The Austrian response to this is that competition among fractional reserve banks, that's actually going to limit credit expansion. Right? The, the banks are not going to make this massive increase in the money supply. And this is because of the adverse clearing mechanism, which is that credit expansion is going to cause an outflow of uh, reserves to rival banks. All right. So if one bank expands uh, more than its supply of potential reserve, uh, supply of, of total reserves, uh, competition among banks is going gonna, is gonna to discipline that bank. The bank's going to go bankrupt, as we would see. All right. So... How does this process work? Well, this process works by virtue of the fact that I made a loan to, who did I make a loan to? I made a loan to Matt, and Matt's going to spend that money. He's not just going to take out a loan and, and, and sit on it. He's going to spend that money, and he's going to spend that money. That money will inevitably wind up at a rival financial institution. 
All right, if the Newman Bank makes the $90,000 loan, it's going to go, it's going to go kaput, all right? Matt's going to spend his loan at the Mises Institute bookstore, um, $90,000 at the bookstore. I could spend it, right? We, we all could, right? It's getting those $2 books. We could get the whole library. Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, so Matt's going to spend his loan at the Mises Institute bookstore and the Mises Institute uh, does not bank at the Newman Bank, unfortunately. They deposit their money at the Bank of Salerno, okay, a very prominent Italian bank, all right? And Joe Salerno and Patrick Newman, you know, we're friends. We're not that good of friends, okay? Because what's going to happen is Joe's going to get $90,000 in Newman Bank money, and he's going to say, well, I don't want $90,000 in Newman Bank money. I want $90,000 in real money, in gold. Uh, Joe, as the owner of the bank, will uh, present the obligation to me uh, as, you know, for redemption in gold. He, you know, he might, we might have a nice dinner. He's going to say, you know what, I got $90,000 in, uh, Newman, um, in, in Newman money. I want gold money. And I'm going to have to tell him, I say, Joe, aren't we friends? And he's going to say, we're not that good of friends, right? And the Newman Bank, we only have $10,000 in gold. I'm going to have to close shop. This is going to be a huge scandal. Everyone's going to be shocked. They say, well, how could this happen to the Newman Bank? It's the most trustworthy bank. Uh, I'm gonna, it's going to be a big scandal and all of that. So uh, from this simple example, we can see that if a bank increases uh, its loans more than the supply of reserves, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to go bankrupt, all right? This is really the adverse uh, clearing, um, uh, clearing mechanism, right? Uh, this, is, uh, th this, is, this is a very, very important uh, feature of, 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 of Austrian economics, really just free market economics, we could say, all right? So in conclusion, competition severely uh, limits credit expansion. Now, you might ask yourself, well, as, as, as Rothbard sort of posits, you could say, imagine, you say, well, what if all the banks form a cartel? I, 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 I talked to, I talk to uh, Joe at the Bank of Salerno, and I say, wait a second, how about this? All right, you won't redeem uh, Newman Bank money, and I won't redeem Bank of Salerno money. And he could say, well, okay, that works. Why don't we do that? Um, the, the problem is, it would fail like every other cartel. So what do we mean by a cartel? A cartel on the free market restricts, it's a group of sellers, they're working together to restrict supply and raise prices, right? Say a bunch of steel, uh, steel firms and so on. Uh, a cartel on, uh, for banks are banks that are working together to increase the supply of fiduciary media in concert, we could say, right? Cartels fail on the free market because of internal and external pressure. What do we mean by that? Internal pressure is the individual members of the cartel start to cheat secretly, right? I might say, well, uh, I'm not going to redeem any of the Bank of Salerno's money, but then I, I'll turn around and I'll try to uh, secretly redeem the money. Right? That's the internal pressure. The external pressure is, say, a, a bank that's outside of the cartel, Maybe it's from a different region, a different, uh, you know, different state, a different country, or so on. Or it could just be a new bank uh, is, is going to try to bust the cartel. They're going to try to redeem the banknote money. All right. So really, on the, on the free market, fractional reserve banks' ability to engage in credit expansion is quite limited. They're not just going to be able to just print money uh, out, out of thin air. Excuse me. So who can print money out of thin air? Right. Uh, well, <laughs> it's going to be the it's going to be the central bank. Right? So there's a lot of characteristics of a central bank we could go through. Uh, I really just want to concentrate on the two major characteristics of a central bank. Uh, one is that it's a banker's bank. What I mean by that is it holds bank reserves. So you and I cannot. Um, deposit our money at the Federal Reserve. But the banks that we keep our money at will deposit their reserves at the Fed. The Fed will pay them interest and so on. And you know, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase and so on, they have an incentive uh, to do this. All right, that's the main feature of a central bank. It is a banker's bank. It's a bank for other banks. Uh, the second feature of a central bank is it is a conductor of monetary policy. Right. So what we mean by monetary policy, it's trying to change monetary aggregates and interest rates 
uh, to affect economic activity. They might try to lower unemployment. They might try to lower inflation. Uh, they want to try to uh, stabilize real output or real GDP and so on, right? <clears throat> We'll talk about some of the problems of monetary policy uh, tomorrow when we have the, the, the lecture on the Austrian business cycle theory. Right? And modern central banks, they have a lot of tools, how they conduct monetary policy. Really the most common tool now, or the main tool we think of as paying interest on reserves. But another major tool that they use is what's known as open market operations, which, is, which refers to buying and selling government securities and other assets uh, from banks uh, or related individuals. And the bank is going to, the Federal Reserve or Central Bank, they're going to say, engage in open market purchases. They're going to try to buy um, uh, government securities to increase bank reserves. And as we'll see, that will lead to an increase in the money supply. So what I want to do for the remainder of the talk is look a little bit about, uh, take a little bit of time and, and look at open market operations uh, and the money multiplier. So what does the money multiplier refer to? The money multiplier refers to, uh, it's, it's the step-by-step -step process of how credit expansion increases the money supply. Because right? really, it's not that the banks, the fractures of banks are the main engine of a monetary expansion. It's the central bank. The central bank is able to just increase reserves out of thin air. right? They, they've altered the deal, so to speak. right? We're, we're, you know, we're not on a gold standard. And as we'll see, each bank, each fractional reserve bank is going to increase the money supply by a little bit. They're all going to work in concert. And you could say the central bank basically facilitates bank cartels, right? Okay. So market operations explain. Let's, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. All right, so let's say the Fed, the Federal Reserve, writes a $1,000 check to bond dealers Powell and Sons. Right, it's named after, of course, Jerome Powell, our current Federal Reserve chair. It literally just prints money out of thin air. It literally is just able to just write a check, and it's, that's the money. Or what it does now is it literally adds the money electronically. All right, so useful pro tip in life, if you know someone who can print money, a.k.a. the Federal Reserve, exploit it. Talk to them. Be friends with them, right? Because they can print as much money as they want. All right, so Powell and Sons, he's going to deposit at a very prestigious bank. He's going to deposit at the Newman Bank. The Newman Bank, yes, we're now working with the cronies. That's where we realize where all the money is. So we're, we're in concert with the central bank. Okay, so let's just start off with a new balance sheet. Um, you know, we have reserves, $1,000 in reserves, and then equity plus liabilities. Well, we're not looking at equity. We've just got liabilities and deposit to Powell and Sons, right? The Powell... And sons can then spend. Uh, they could redeem for, say, cash or dollars. That's the money proper now. Whatever they would like to do. All right. Now, the Newman Bank, I'm going to uh, deposit the check at the Fed and count it as reserves. All right. So I'm going to earn interest uh, from the Fed. And then if uh, Powell and Sons or whoever else is depositing at the bank wants uh, cash, I'll have some on the side. I won't put all of my reserves at the Fed. Uh, but if I need more, I'll just go to the Fed and they can just, you know, the printer goes, right, and they'll just print out some, some cash notes for me and everything will be great. Okay. So then what, am, what is the Newman Bank going to do with these reserves? It doesn't just want to sit on the reserves. It's burning a hole through their pockets, so to speak, right? So the Newman Bank is going to engage in credit expansion uh, by this formula. Right? It's, it's only going to engage in a fraction of the increase in reserves. Change in reserves times one minus uh, reserve requirement, right? or the reserve ratio. The, the central bank, uh, the Federal Reserve, can set reserve requirements. That's one of its functions. Right? So let's say that the reserve requirements are 10%. For every uh, you know, $100 it has, a bank has in deposits, it has to keep $10, $10 excuse me, in reserves uh, either at the bank or at the, the at the Federal Reserve, right? So what this means is that the Newman Bank can engage in credit expansion uh, by around, uh, by basically 100 times 1 minus 0 0.1, which is 100 times 0 0.9. Uh, I can make a $900 loan to Yellen & Co. by Janet Yellen, the next, uh, the previous uh, chair of the Federal Reserve, all right, so we have IOU from uh, Yellen & Co, $900, and then I have a deposit. So she's going to pay me back, Yellen & Co, excuse me, will pay me back $900 plus interest 
in, let's say, a year, all right? Now, what Yellen and Co. is going to do is they're going to spend that money, say, uh, on, you know, at some, uh, at some business, and let's say that business uh, banks at the Bernanke Bank, right? Um, uh, this is the revolving door. After you, after you work at the Fed, you create your own financial institution in this imaginary world. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to look at the balance sheet for the Bernanke Bank, but uh, what I will show is what happens with the Newman Bank because the Bernanke Bank is going to want to redeem the $900 uh, 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 check, say, from Yellen & Co., and the Newman Bank is going to have enough reserves. So what will happen is... There we go, right? Um, the deposit goes away. I don't know, you know, there's, there's no more deposit to Yellen & Co. And my reserves go down by $900. So we're kind of right back to where we started before the loan. The only difference is instead of $1,000 in reserves, I have $100 in reserves and I have an interest-bearing asset. This is what fractional reserve banks try to do because they're hoping that, well, Powell and Sons isn't gonna want the whole $1,000 in cash it might only want a fraction, and uh, after a certain time has passed a year, um, I'm going to get $900 plus interest, and I'll just be able to rinse and repeat. Easy money, as they say. Okay, so this is this is what I would try to do. All right. Um, <clears throat> so the process uh, does not end. The Bernanke Bank is going to expand uh, credit by the same formula, which is $900 times. 1 minus 0.1 or 0.9, $810. All right, so the money supply first increased by $1,000. The Fed just printed the money out of thin air. Then the Newman Bank increased the money supply by $900. Then the Bernanke Bank increased the money supply by uh, $810. And the cycle repeats. Uh, whoever the Bernanke Bank lent the money to, they're going to, uh, want, to re want to redeem it. And let's say... Uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're going to spend it. Excuse me, it's going to be deposited in another bank, let's say the Greenspan Guarantee, um, and then they're going to redeem the money from the Bernanke Bank and so on, and they're going to follow, say, with their own loan, 810 times, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, 1 minus 0.1, that's $729, so on and so forth. The story goes until the numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller. So deposits increased by $1,000 plus $900 plus $810 plus $729. And this process, in theory, can keep going on and on and on and on and on until the total amount of money created is $10,000. And this is equal to the formula uh, change in reserves times 1 divided by reserve requirements. Right? So in this case, it's 1,000 times one divided by 0.1, and that's $10,000. All right, so it's one bank isn't just going to increase the money supply by $10,000, the Newman Bank. It's going to occur in a step-by-step -step process. The central bank has facilitated the increase in the money supply, all right? So the central bank, uh, by engaging in open market purchases, by buying a bond from Powell & Sons, leads to a much greater increase in the money supply. All right, and the central bank... Uh, you'll often be taught they want to do this to, say, stimulate economic activity. But what we don't really learn about too much is the fact that, well, uh, this process, uh, by just pumping in more reserves and increasing the money supply, uh, this is going to create winners and losers, as, 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 as we were taught uh, in the previous lecture by Dr. Klein, right? Because the people who receive the new money first, uh, you know, Powell and Sons, the Newman Bank, let's say, uh, Yellen & Co., and so on, their nominal income is going to rise more than the increase in prices. So their real income increases, right? And then as the money goes, the money uh, gets spent, and the money supply keeps increasing, but it's in smaller and smaller bursts, if you will, uh, it's going to eventually go to the late receivers, people who uh, get an increase in nominal income but it's less than the rise in prices. Uh, this is what central banking really does. It redistributes income. This is why we all just got a little sticker that says um, inflation is a tax, right? Uh, you know, the idea is it's taxing the people who receive the money last and redistributing it to the people uh, who receive the money first. Uh, this is why everybody wants a printing press, because right? they want to be the first receivers. 
All right. So this is really, we could say, <laughs> the sort of the secret of banking. It's not that competition among fractures or banks leads to increases in the money supply. It instead is uh, the cartelizer of said fracture reserve banks, which is the central bank. Okay, the central bank is responsible for increases in the money supply. All right, so I think that's going to be it. Thanks for watching. For more, I highly recommend you read Murray Rothbard's The Mystery of Banking. Uh, you could also read Bob Murphy's Understanding Money Mechanics. And we're going to talk about some of the effects of this credit expansion process tomorrow when we look at Austrian business cycle theory and basically how this credit expansion affects the structure of production. So I think I will end here. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>